Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Meet the Expert event. I'm Mark Hodson with the Buena Vista Museum, and today we're here with Dr. Katie O'Sullivan. Dr. O'Sullivan's interest in geology formed long ago from her enjoyment of spending time outdoors, surrounded by rocks and all they entail. Since she always wanted to be an astronaut, it is no surprise that she has specialized in planetary geology. Today, she will be sharing with us how Earth's moon was formed and some explanations of some lunar features, including how lunar meteorites contribute to these understandings. Dr. O'Sullivan received her bachelor's degree in geology from Cal State Bakersfield. Her graduate education included an internship at NASA, where she helped plan future lunar landing site locations. This also provided her with an opportunity to drive a load of moon rocks across the country and then blast them with lasers. She completed her PhD in planetary geology at the University of Notre Dame. She is currently an associate professor at Cal State Bakersfield, where she and her students are studying meteorites from the moon to answer questions about lunar geology and lunar geologic history. She also teaches courses in introductory geology, mineralogy, field geology, and planetary geology, and enjoys taking students and sometimes her dog on field trips to learn about how rocks form here on Earth and on our moon. While she has not yet realized her dream of being an astronaut, Dr. O'Sullivan has studied geology here on Earth in places as varied as Hawaii, Iceland, and Nepal. Before we get started, if you like today's event and you'd like to see more content like this from the Buena Vista Museum, then I invite you all to make a donation. You can make a donation to the museum anytime at buenavistamuseum.org slash donate. I'll put that address in the chat window. Also, please make sure that you keep your devices muted. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat window. There should be a chat button on your screen. So just click that and we will address those questions during the question and answer period. Without further ado, I welcome Dr. O'Sullivan. Thank you so much. Uh, it's wonderful to be here and I'm so excited to talk to everyone about planetary geology and the moon. So with that, let me share my screen here. Some of my more favorite questions about planetary geology are listed here down at the bottom. Where did the moon come from? Where is it going? <laughs> what were the first rocks to form on the moon? And why do the near side of the moon and the far side of the moon look so different? So those are questions that I'm going to kind of touch on tonight. And uh, I'd like all of us to think like planetary geologists tonight and um, make some observations uh, of the maps that I'm gonna show you in these slides. So it should be pretty fun. But um, all of this research is not done in isolation. So I am not some crazy Einstein genius. I have so much help and particularly at Cal State Bakersfield that help comes from students, both graduate students and undergraduate students. So there's some pictures here of um, my students and uh, I just wanted to give a, a shout out to them because they are uh, so wonderful at, at helping with this really exciting research. And there's a picture of my dog because I had to put that in there. She's also helps. <laughs> okay, so the moon is our uh, closest celestial object. This picture here shows the earth and the moon to scale. Now they're much further apart in real life, but it gives you an idea of exactly how large the moon is. It's pretty small compared to Earth, but as far as moons go, it's quite large. Uh, Mars has two moons that are much, much smaller than our moon here. So we are pretty special in, in uh, as far as moons go because they are, because ours is so large compared to others in the solar system. But it's, as I said, it's not that big. So to give you a better idea of how large it is, I put this map of the United States on the near side of the moon. So you can see, you know, if you were to drive across the moon or drive across the United States about, you know, how long it would take. So we haven't explored the moon that much. We've sent um, six uh, human missions to the moon. So imagine if you were a geologist and you went to six spots in the United States 
and then tried to piece together the geology of the United States from just those six locations, you would have a very incomplete picture of the geology of the United States. Um, just think about the rocks that you see driving down the road, you know, like there's all kinds of different colors of rocks and different shapes and we have really big mountains and deep valleys and large plains. So there's a number of really exciting questions in planetary geology because our picture is so incomplete. Um, so this is a, a, um, a little picture here of the Earth and the Moon to scale. So this is how big the Earth is compared to how big the moon is, and then the distance is to scale here. So the moon is really far away, which is why we've only been a couple of times. It's pretty difficult to get there. Uh, we figured it out in the late 60s, early 70s, and we're trying to figure it out again, how to get to the moon. And one of the reasons that we want to go back to the moon is eventually we may go on to Mars. And in order to go on to Mars, we really need to you know, take a little baby step first and figure out how exactly humans are in space again in the year 2022. Um, so the moon is really far away, not as far as Mars. Um, and it's a really great stepping stone to Mars for that reason. So before we go to the moon and before we talk about the moon, uh, since we are going to be planetary geologists tonight, I thought I would uh, put this planetary map up of Earth. So take a moment here to make some observations about what you see on the map. They don't have to be, if you're not a geologist, that's, that's cool. Um, they can be, you know, just non-geology observations. So one of the first things that I see is lots of blue. There's lots of water here on Earth. And then I also see ice at the top and the bottom of this map. So there's water in two forms that I can see. There's liquid water in the oceans and solid water in the, the ice caps. I also see pieces of land. Some of them are connected and then some of them are separated by ocean. I see, you know, areas of green. There's lots of life here on earth. Life is, is covered, has covered the planet. Um, to the deepest parts of the ocean and to the deepest uh, parts of the crust as well. And also to the tallest mountains. So there's just life everywhere on earth. As a geologist, I see chains of mountains and I have my mouse here, I'm gonna circle uh, the Himalayan uh, mountains here between India and China. So there's long chains of mountains we have one closer uh, to Bakersfield here. We have the Sierra Nevada and the Rockies. The Rockies show up more on this picture here. Um, we also have areas of desert, large plains, and um, we have little islands too. But um, I would say, you know, the, the most striking feature, the two most striking features are water and life. And because we live on earth, we think those things might kind of go together. Um, so we don't have any life on the moon and we don't expect to find any evidence of life on the moon. We do have a little bit of water and the more moon rocks that we study, the more water we are finding. Nothing like an ocean, um, but we do have, you know, a tiny, tiny percentage of water on the moon. So that's pretty exciting. So as a planetary geologist, what I see when I look at this map is the lack of craters. So if I switch um, over to the moon now, the first thing I see as a planetary geologist are all of these circles. And these craters are formed by impacts. So they're not volcanic craters. They are formed from a meteorite hitting the moon and making a really big hole and then splashing bright rocks out. So you might see this crater right down here with these large, uh, really long, bright rays. The other thing I see when I look at this picture is dark areas. So there are these really large uh, filled in craters 
of black stuff. <laughs> and there's a lot more of it on the near side than there is over here on the far side. Um, the other thing that I see is no chains, long chains of mountains like here on earth. And then I don't see any oceans of water, no life. Um, and that's about it. So the moon seems to have, some would say, you know, maybe not as uh, of a complex history. But as you'll find out tonight, it's, it's pretty complex and it's exciting to tackle those questions. Um, so the near side and the far side of the moon look really different. I hope that's also very obvious. The near side has a lot more of that black stuff and the far side has a lot more of the light white stuff. And just a side note here, the near side of the moon is the side of the moon that always faces the earth. And it, there's only one side of the moon that faces the Earth um, because of the Earth's gravity. So it locks the um, rotation of the moon such that the moon rotates at exactly the same rate as it rotates around or as it orbits around the Earth. So we end up only seeing one side of the moon. And when the moon first formed, it was spinning um, and the <laughs> Who, if there were humans on the earth then, which there weren't, um, it would have been, you would have been able to see the near side and the far side. But since for the past uh, couple of billion years, we've only been able to see the near side of the moon from Earth's perspective. Okay, so near side and far side are different. We have black areas, we have white areas, we have lots of lots of craters. So let's continue our planetary geology observations here by looking at another map. This is an elevation map. So the scale is down here at the bottom and it's in kilometers. So we have minus eight kilometers all the way up to 10 kilometers. So that's the total amount of uh, elevation that we see on the moon. And so the deepest parts of the moon are these purple colors, really cool colors. And these are gonna be on the far side down kind of near the South Pole. And the highest elevation parts of the moon are nearby, and they are right here also on the far side. So the observations that I make here with this map are the near side and the far side of the moon also look different in elevation. The near side appears to be much lower in elevation overall. And the far side of the moon appears to have a really low air elevation part and then a kind of a high elevation part. You might notice that there's a big hole here on the far side of the moon down near the South Pole. It doesn't really show up in the visual image. I'll, I'll go back one slide. But maybe now you kind of see this shadowy area here. So it really shows up on the elevation map. It's a very deep hole. And this is the oldest, largest crater in the entire solar system is right here on the moon, right next door to us. Uh, it doesn't look like a, like a perfect uh, crater shape anymore because it's so old and it's been eaten up and chewed up by other craters that have subsequently landed in it. But it is the oldest and largest uh, crater. So going back to the near side, these areas, much lower in our elevation generally, and what this map allows us to see is how rough the surface is. So the surface on the near side of the moon is generally a lot smoother. The surface on the far side of the moon is a lot rougher. And if we were to look at these smooth areas over here, these correlate to those dark areas that we saw on the previous slide. And if we look at these higher elevation areas here, that correlates to those really bright white areas. So maybe we can start making some hypotheses at this point. Let's look at one more map. This is a chemistry map. So I'm a geochemist, so I have to put some chemistry in this presentation. Um, and this is a map of thorium. Now, thorium is a radioactive uh, element. It doesn't really go into rocks readily. Uh, we wouldn't expect to see lots of thorium just around. 
Um, but when we made this map of the moon, we got back a really striking result. And that is that, again, the near side and the far side look very different. And those black smooth areas correspond to areas of really high thorium. So in this map, the uh, warm colors are higher concentrations of thorium. This is in parts per million, so 10 to 12 parts per million. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a lot for a rock. Um, so these, this area here um, on the near side of the moon is high in thorium, it's dark in color, it's smooth, and it's low elevation. And then that hole on the back side of the moon also kind of has an elevated concentration of thorium. It has two to four parts per million thorium, which is higher than all of the white areas <clears throat> around it. So we can say that the, the white areas are higher in elevation um, and they are lower in thorium and they're also rougher in surface texture. So I'm just putting this one in kind of for fun. This is a geologic map and a, ge a geologist, they color the units with all of these crazy wacky colors. And so it ends up looking kind of chaotic, um, but each of these colors here represents a different geologic unit. Um, and so these, uh, this big uh, red area here corresponds to that area with high thorium, smooth, low elevation and dark color. Um, but if you ever are want to see a bunch of uh, colorful maps, I would recommend Googling a, 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 a geologic map of the moon because it's quite colorful. All right. Um, so now that we've made some observations with those maps, uh, I want to go take a step back here and tell you a little piece of lunar planetary exploration history. This is the first photo of the backside of the moon. So this was, when this photo came in, this was the first time human eyes had seen uh, the backside of the moon, the far side. And this photo was taken in 1959 by the Soviet Union. And this was during the space race. So Soviet Union and um, the US were, you know, racing to get to the moon first. And the Soviet Union was totally killing it at the beginning of the space race. We ended up winning because we sent humans to the moon. But in the beginning, it looked like the Soviet Union was going to win because they had these really major milestones, like sending us the first photo of the backside of the moon. Now, how we got this photo is a really fun story. So the Soviet Union sent a spacecraft into Earth beyond Earth, sorry, beyond Earth's orbit. And they sent it all the way to the moon. It was the first spacecraft to get to the moon. And it was the first spacecraft to stabilize itself. Um, and it was also the first spacecraft to go to the backside of the moon and perform operations. So the spacecraft gets to the moon. It goes to the backside of the moon. It's no longer in radio communication with Earth. It has to do all of this stuff automatic or you know in automated robot mode. It stabilizes itself. And then it starts taking pictures on film. Now there's a light sensor in the spacecraft. So when the, when the sensor reads light, then the camera knows to turn on and start taking a picture. And the camera is attached to the spacecraft. So the spacecraft has to be really stable. So it starts taking pictures on film. And then <laughs> we can't take this, we can't take the film and like land it back on earth. That's way too complicated. What we did or what they decided to do was make a miniature one hour photo inside of the spacecraft, develop the pictures, and then fax the pictures back to Earth. So that's why there's all of these horizontal lines through this photo. If you've ever seen a fax, it'll have those lines um, through it. So there was a miniature one hour photo that operated in really cold temperatures in zero gravity, 
the photos were developed, they were dried, and then they, um, they, uh, the photos had a, a light beam shine through them to digitally or to, to, to digitize the photo into an electronic signal that we could uh, receive here back on Earth. The fun part about all of this is um, the Soviet Union had all of this technology figured out. They couldn't figure out how to have film develop in cold temperatures. And so what they did is they captured um, a spy balloon from the US and stole the film out of it, took the film out of it and used American film in their spacecraft to develop these photos. So it's a really interesting, fun story. It seems like it overcame so many technological hurdles in 1959 and um you know the result of this photo is actually like it's a pretty good pretty good spot on photo here we can see that there are craters that are filled with this dark rock but not that many on the far side and um you know in 2009 we had much better photo taking abilities we weren't taking these pictures on film anymore and this is what we have today so we have a really nice height high resolution photo of the backside of the moon, but it's really special that this, this has existed since 1959. Okay, so back to thinking about <laughs> modern day space exploration. This is a map of uh, some of the things that have landed on the moon and it's numbered one to 22 and it goes by order of uh, date. So the Soviet Union had the Luna program. So it's all of these here in red. Uh, the United States had the surveyor program, which are all of these in this light blue color. And then eventually we were uh, landing humans on the moon and that was the Apollo program here. And then uh, re more recently, uh, China has launched the Chang'e missions in yellow here that are landing on the moon and roving around and collecting samples and returning them back to Earth. Um, so the moon has been explored somewhat. Uh, as far as geologists are concerned, we want the samples. We care about the, the hard rocks and the chemistry that we can get from orbital data. Um, so just looking at this map here, we haven't explored too terribly much of the moon and only one mission has gone to the far side of the moon. So our samples are really heavily biased. We just looked at those maps in the previous slides and we looked at how the near side and the far side of the moon are very different. So it's kind of a problem that we only have samples from the near side of the moon. We really need samples from the far side of the moon and from the north and south pole so we can get a better, more comprehensive picture of uh, the moon's geology and its history. Um, so NASA has plans to do so. We're going to send humans back to the moon, probably to the south pole, maybe to uh, the far side and this program is called the artemis program and um, it's really going to teach us teach this generation my generation how we can do space exploration with humans um, so that we can go to mars so the artemis program here has the moon in the foreground and then mars is in the background because it's a pathway to mars um, and this exploration is um, necessary to get to mars and um, Along the way, we're gonna find out and collect so many amazing geology samples and it's a really exciting time to be a planetary geologist right now. Um, so the key questions that NASA wants all planetary lunar geologists to address are how did the moon form? And then what, since it formed, what has it been doing? Um, so that's what my research focuses on as a geologist. Um, so I'm going to give you just a little bit of background about the lunar geology um, that is that we know um, so far. Uh, it's a very generalized, um, but it'll give you a good uh, it'll give you a good per uh, perception on what our future problems might be. So on the moon, there's no plate tectonics. So there's no uh, convecting mantle that moves the plates around. There's no um, earthquakes or there's no large earthquakes that happen like in a plate tectonic setting there's no mountain chains being formed no volcanoes forming so geologically speaking there's not much action happening on the moon other than craters setting it 
and the moon never had plate tectonics. So it never had chains of mountains forming and chains of volcanoes forming. There's very little water on the moon, which probably is related to not having any plate tectonics. Um, so there's no oceans um, and there's no minerals on the moon that contain water. The moon is made up of two main rock types and you can they're color coded. So we have the highlands, which are the, the light colors. And I have a little picture of a highlands rock here. And the highlands are made of a mineral called plagioclase. It's called plagioclase feldspar. It's also called anorthite, um, but maybe you've heard of plagioclase. It's a mineral that contains lots of calcium and aluminum, and it's really light colored. And if you have ever seen a piece of, um, of granite, I'll hold one up here. Um, it's made up of white parts and dark parts, and these white parts are the mineral plagioclase. So you have seen lots of plagioclase, it's the most common mineral on the surface of the earth. <laughs> um, and it's common here on the, the moon too. There's a significant chemical difference between the rocks, the, the plagioclase on the earth and the plagioclase on the moon, which we'll see later. Um, but plagioclase is what makes up this white area. The, the rocks on the moon are really old. So the moon and the earth are both about four and a half billion years old. That's how old the solar system is. Everything kind of formed at the same time. The rocks record all of that history um, because there's no plate tectonics, they're not being recycled. So it's really neat that the, the um, rocks on the moon are so old. So that's the highlands, these light colored rocks here. But what about those big dark areas? Those are made of basalt. And that is regular basalt that you might see on um, Hawaii or let's see this rock here. So it has holes in it. Um, this picture that I have on the slide also has lots of holes. Um, so this uh, rock is made up of minerals called pyroxene and olivine. And the rock itself is um, rich in magnesium and iron. So it's a lot heavier than that Highlands rock that's rich in calcium and aluminum. The basalts are slightly younger, but they're still really old, uh, 4.3 to 3 billion years old, 3.1 billion years old. So one of the main questions we have is, well, where did the basalts come from? There's no plate tectonics on the moon. So how did we get melted rock in the interior of the moon? So I'll get back to that later. Um, but just to take a step back here, because, you know, it's these questions are exciting for me to think about. I'm a geologist, but why do why should other people care about the, how the moon formed? So one of these um, per, per, one of the reasons everyone should care is if we're going to go back to the moon, we need to know where to go for resources. Um, so this picture on the left here shows, you know, a, a future moon base where we might be extracting mineral resources from the moon. Maybe we are able to make rocket fuel on the moon, which would be much more convenient than lifting stuff off of Earth. The moon has a lot less gravity than Earth. Uh, maybe there's rare Earth elements, um, so like we can make batteries from the moon rocks. Um, so these these uh, potential resources, all of these um, uh, information, it comes from the geology, it comes from the rocks that uh, we are looking at, that I look at every day. And then, you know, the moon, we care about why the moon formed because that tells us how other things might form. So this picture on the right here shows, you know, a, a fiery birth of some planet and it's lots of molten things happening and and um, we just don't have the rocks left on Earth to answer those questions. Because we have plate tectonics and rocks are constantly being destroyed and weathered and subducted and then um, formed into metamorphosed into new rocks, we just don't have rocks that are that old, as old as you know the Earth. So the moon is a more like a fossilized Earth. We can think of it that way. And um, it's a really great place, a close place to go and pick up those fossils so that we can learn more about how the earth formed and the other interior planets like Mercury and Venus and Mars. 
Okay, so how did the moon form is what we're going to think about for the next little bit here. And I want to give you some of the more, these are the wrong, the wrong ways that the moon formed. We, we kind of have a really good idea of how the moon formed. Um, but early on, we really didn't have much to go on. These models uh, came about before we went to the moon, so we didn't have rocks to look at. Um, so one of the first ideas was that the moon was a sister world and it formed in orbit around Earth as the Earth formed. Um, but this is, the chemistry does not agree with this model. Um, and the orbital dynamics also don't agree with this model. Um, so then scientists thought, well, maybe the moon formed somewhere else and then Earth captured it in its gravitational pull. And this also doesn't work with the orbital dynamics. Um, the moon's actually moving away from us, not closer to us. So that doesn't work out. The, the, my most favorite one of these wrong models is that the early Earth was spinning so fast that a chunk of it flew off <laughs> and then formed the moon. And then that's why we have a big hole on the Earth, which is the Pacific Ocean Basin. Now, this was around before we had plate tectonics. So <laughs> that's why it's kind of silly now. We know why the Pacific Ocean Basin is there because we have the plate tectonic model. Um, and the early Earth, as far as orbital dynamics go, was never spinning that fast to fling a large piece of it off. So what we have now is called the giant impact hypothesis. And it's this idea that um, a large thing hit the Earth and then a big piece flung off. So in this artist's rendition, uh, this larger thing is the very early Earth. Um, and then this thing here is a very large object that hits the Earth and flings a bunch of stuff off and continues to go along its way and makes a bunch of space debris. And then eventually that coalesces and forms the moon. So it was a very fiery birth for the moon. And um, because of that, uh, the surface of the moon was probably entirely molten, as in this picture here. And then early on, there was a bunch of space debris. And as indicated by this kind of ring that's around Earth. And so there was a bunch of impacts in the beginning. And a lot of space debris was probably hitting both the moon and the Earth, but we just don't have a record of it on the Earth anymore. But the moon still keeps that record. So as a geologist, I don't really know about all of those orbital parameters and the physics behind um, the moon's birth, but what I can do is look at the rocks and then from there tell myself and the world something about uh, where those rocks might have come from and how they formed. So um, let me go back one more slide. So we have a magma ball, basically, uh, that is the moon. So no solid rocks whatsoever. As that magma starts to cool off, things are going to start to solidify and crystallize. And the first things to crystallize are heavier than the magma. So that's what these little squares falling down are. So the, th the crystals that crystallize fall towards the interior of the moon. And I'm gonna go back one more <laughs> slide so we don't watch it on repeat. The, the first crystals to form sink down towards the interior of the moon and they make a layer that gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And then eventually there's no more ingredients for those crystals to form. So a different type of crystal starts to form. And, um, as that new crystal starts to form, it has a different composition and it ends up being lighter than the magma from which it came. And so those crystals float to the top of the moon. And in this rendition, those crystals are gonna be that white um, layer that starts to grow from the top down. And then we're left with a little thin layer of magma in between those two layers. So this is the same uh, schematic, or this is a different schematic showing the same idea. So we have the first um, little wedge here showing that there's a lot of magma and that crystals start to form. And those crystals are called olivine and it's a mineral that's rich in iron and magnesium. 
it forms and sinks down. And then another mineral called pyroxene, also rich in iron and magnesium, sinks down. So they're both denser than the magma. And then as those ingredients kind of run out of the magma, then a new mineral has to start forming. And that mineral is plagioclase, the really bright white one. And it floats to the top. It's, it's enriched in calcium and aluminum. It's a lot lighter than the magma. So it's going to float to the top and make a crust. And these arrows indicate, you know, like heat escaping the uh, through the crust, and then there's convection happening. Um, but then eventually we end up with a, a really thick crust of the white mineral, plagioclase, a really, really thick, almost like a, the mantle layer would be um, of olivine and pyroxene. And then we have this last little bit of melt, this little thin layer here. And that's where all of the fun geology action happens. So that last little bit of melt contains all of the elements that don't normally go into minerals. Um, so it contains really wacky things like thorium, for example. It contains other stuff like rare earth elements, gold would be there, uranium, um, anything that doesn't really fit into the crystalline structure of our olivine, pyroxene, and plagioclase. So that last melt is enriched in thorium. And this model with all these little pie wedges here suggests that that layer would be it circling and circling the entire moon. It would be a global layer. But what we don't see is a global layer of thorium. So I brought back up the thorium map and we have a lot more thorium on the near side and not so much on the far side. We do have a little bit down here. So our model of how the lunar magma ocean crystallize does not correspond to our observations here of our global thorium. So this is a fun, interesting problem that we can use samples to address. Now, just to convince you that the lunar magma ocean did in fact happen, we have a lot of rocks that could only form through a global lunar magma ocean. And these rocks are what make up the lunar highlands. And they're that bright white color. And I have, I'll hold this up again so that again, it's that white rock or that white mineral that you would see in a piece of granite. Um, and these rocks are mostly made up of that mineral uh, called plagioclase. So our unanswered questions about the lunar magma ocean are, there are many, and here's just a few. How long was it crystallizing? How long was it molten? How deep was it? Was the entire ball of the moon molten or was there some sort of core? And then what, what was the initial melt composition? What was the chemistry of the giant ball of magma? Is it the same chemistry as Earth? Um, and then in particular, my research um, at Cal State Bakersfield focuses on, does the lunar magma ocean model explain all of the rock types that we see? Because remember our rocks only come from the near side. Um, so our models are slightly skewed. Um, and so one way that we can get around that is by looking at rocks that come from other areas of the moon. And again, we care about all of this because we're going to go back to the moon and utilize the moon's resources. And generally we need to know, you know how planets form. So that way we can understand Earth better. Um, so the Apollo landing sites, I have them mapped out here, um, only went to the near side, very limited, only six of them. Here's um, an astronaut deploying a seismometer which detected moon quakes. Um, these landing sites are where most of our rocks come from, most of our moon rocks, and they're only on the near side. So they also kind of correspond to those areas of high thorium. So this is a problem. We need rocks from other places on the moon, and that's where meteorites come in. So meteorites are things that are blasted off of the moon and eventually make their way to Earth, and they can come from anywhere on the moon. I mean, like statistically, like they're going to come from you know, much more representative place than the Apollo samples. So I have one such meteorite and there's a picture of it here and then I'll show, I'll hold it up to the camera. 
so you can see it. It's cut in half now, but <laughs> this is what it looked like when it was whole. And then there's the cut end. You can see little speckles in it. Um, and these little white parts are the bright parts of the moon. And then the darker areas are those basaltic pieces from the dark areas of the moon. Um, so this is a rock made up of a, a little pieces of other rocks, and it does not look like much. I mean, this is not like what a meteorite, when you think of a meteorite, which I have a more common meteorite, this is what you think of, like a really dark, heavy thing that's magnetic, uh, but lunar meteorites don't look like that. Um, and so importantly, they can come from anywhere on the moon, and they provide us with samples that um, can potentially come from the far side. So that's really exciting. So uh, this lunar meteorite, um, I took it and I sliced it up into a bunch of really thin little pieces of rock that are mounted onto a glass slide so that you can put it underneath the microscope. So the slide here is showing um, the picture and then I'm holding one, the same rock up to the camera. Um, so they're about an inch wide. Um, and I got about 20 of these little tiny thin pieces of rock from half of the meteorite. And um, again, we can look at these rocks with the microscope, and then we can also analyze their chemistry. So this piece right here, this large chunk, is a piece of that really plagioclase rich rock that came from the lunar magma ocean. So we have a snapshot of the lunar magma ocean right here, which is really exciting. So what my research group does is we look at the chemistry of that, we compare it to the Apollo samples, and then we try to fit it into the lunar magma ocean model. And I'm gonna spoiler alert here, it doesn't fit into the lunar magma ocean model. So the model itself is, um, needs to be updated with the, with the more comprehensive set of rocks that, that we are now getting. So one thing that people always ask me when I show them the meteorite is how do we know it's from the moon? So I have a few graphs here. This is my only slide with graphs to convince you that it's from the moon. And the short answer is we know it's from the moon because of the chemistry. And in particular, we have the um, iron and manganese concentrations of different um, minerals. And the iron and magnesium mag manganese ratio is uh, unique to the earth, to the moon, to Mars, to Venus, to the asteroid belt. Um, so one way that we can quickly identify a meteorite is based on these two elements. So these little dots here are um, analyses from our meteorite and then from published data. And then the line shows you kind of what they should fall on. And then the green dots are from our data, from published data, and then the line that they should fall on. And then the black lines are the earth trends. Um, the next way that we can tell these rocks are from the moon is by looking at the amount of calcium that is in those plagioclase minerals. And so on this bottom graph here, we have, it's labeled AN percent. What that means is the amount of calcium that's in it. Um, and so the higher the number here, the more calcium that the plagioclase contains. And all of these gray blobs here are the most calcium rich things that we have on earth. And all of the moon rocks plot way further to the right and contain a lot more calcium. So the moon rocks are all these colored symbols here. Um, so we simply cannot get a calcium rich plagioclase on the earth like we do on the moon. Also, we don't have any common minerals like quartz or calcite um, or clay in our moon rocks, in our meteorites. And those things are in every single rock here on earth. So we conclude that this rock came from the moon, <laughs> which is good because, um, you know, it came from a meteorite dealer who was selling as a rock from the moon. So it was good. So we can do better than that with the chemistry. We can tell you where it came from on the moon. So this is um, a map of what you, a visible map that you would see um, of the entire globe of the moon. And the middle part here is the near side. And then the two edges are the far side of the moon. And I have the Apollo landing sites listed on here. Uh, those are those orange numbers. And I also have the Soviet Union uh, Luna landing sites in green. And then these blue pixels 
are pixels that match the chemistry of our rock with the chemistry um, that we see on the surface. So our rock came from one of these blue pixels, which is really exciting. And specifically, these pixels and our rock, what we're comparing is the amount of um, iron, thorium, calcium, and aluminum. So all of those values match um, between the surface of the moon and our rock. So it's pretty exciting. Now, for future studies, we are going to look at these individual rock fragments. So I have just a couple of random pictures here. They're all at a different scale. You'll see the scale bar down at the bottom. Um, some of them are quite large and some of them are quite tiny. But each one of these little rock fragments is a fragment um, of a rock from a different part on the moon. Because it is made up of a bunch of different bits and pieces, those bits and pieces are distributed by impacts hitting the moon and flying rock fragments everywhere. So we get a actually really large sample area based in this little tiny rock. And so all of these rock fragments, we think came from the lunar magma ocean originally. And that's going to tell us about the chemistry of the lunar magma ocean, how it evolved, what was crystallizing, how long it crystallized, how things were mixing in the lunar magma ocean. Um, really exciting questions. So the goals of my research group are to evaluate all of these different rock fragments that we see in the meteorite. And we want to see what this, what interaction this last melt had with um, the crust uh, above it and how it produced rocks. Um, why was there melting? Um, and in doing so, we are going to end up challenging the lunar magma ocean model. We're going to make the model more robust. We're going to make it more precise with the additional rocks that we are adding to the lunar rock collection. So the basalts that fill those craters on the near side of the moon came from the heat that is produced by this last little bit of melt that was enriched in thorium. So the last bit of melt is enriched in thorium. Thorium is a radioactive element. Over millions and millions of years, tens of millions of years, enough heat builds up that some of the crust melts and then percolates up and then forms a little basalt uh, layer on the surface of the moon. But the lunar magma ocean says that that melt should be global, should be surround the entire moon. And we don't see that melt everywhere. We only see basalt on the near side, a few places on the far side. And then we don't see a thorium uh, signature everywhere on the moon. It's different on the near side and the far side. So these are some really fun, interesting questions that um, myself and other research groups at different universities are studying. And with the potential um, new rock samples that are coming in the next couple of years with the NASA Artemis missions, we can really um, you know, figure out exactly what's happening with the lunar magma ocean model. So as always, our key questions are, how did the moon form and what's been happening since? And um, NASA intends to, aim, you know, to continue to answer these questions with the Artemis mission. Um, so I would like to uh, thank you all for coming tonight and I hope that you um, got to think a little bit like a planetary geologist. Um, yesterday was the 53rd anniversary of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landing on the moon. And so this picture on the left here is a picture that Neil Armstrong took of Buzz Aldrin and Buzz is um, deploying one of the geological instruments from the lunar module um, so that they can place it on the surface of the earth. So it's been 53 years since we first returned uh, human, you know, samples from the moon. And uh, we're going to go back to the moon in just a few short years and collect more samples and work on these really exciting problems. So with that, thank you so much. And I welcome any questions. Thank you. Maybe uh, I should see if our uh, remote attendee has any questions first. He's muted. I hope I set it up so people can unmute. Let's see. Okay, I think we do have a question. Hey. Okay, you may ask your question. Wait, do you remember your question? 
Lauren, get on the camera and ask. Come over here and ask. ask. You can ask her. Okay. Um, did this when, um, when a plan when the planet crashed into the earth, did the um chunk roll back on the earth? Did what roll back from the earth? Did, did the chunk grow back on the earth? The part of the earth that got knocked off, did that grow back and heal the earth? That's uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So the chunk ripped off of earth and then the earth was entirely molten like lava at that point in time. And so it formed a sphere again. So there's no really big hole on the earth. And then the chunk that came off formed another sphere and that became the moon. Okay. So were two separate things. Um, and they were both because of all of the energy involved in that piece hitting the earth, both of them were entirely liquid or like lava. Okay. Lauren, what do you want to say? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your question. I know at the museum we have a number of false color image maps, and I've read stories about how enterprising people have used uh, for this analysis and these uh, wavelengths are, that were taken uh, images and combine them to find things like copper deposits on earth where they hadn't seen before. Have they done any of that with the moon to identify uh, things that might be worth uh, trying to uh, mine and send back to earth or use for, like you say, for uh, future space travel? Yeah, so that's how we got the thorium map. Uh, we sent a satellite around the moon and collected um, spectrometer data. Um, and with a thorium map, they use neutrons. And so you bounce a beam down to the, map, the moon, and then you the beam comes back up to the spacecraft. And the changes that are happening in space are what tell you what uh, element is there. We can only do it for a couple of different things because of the way that this spectronomy works out. Um, so we have maps of minerals, and then we have maps of thorium and maps of um, hydrogen, which can tell us how much water is there. But we don't have anything like copper or gold uh, or anything like like a classic mining uh, application might be. I imagine some of those are uh, more controlled by plate tectonics. You've already said we don't got none of that. There. Yeah, yeah. So the plate tectonics processes really do concentrate those uh, minerals into economic um, concentrations where we can go and mine them. And we don't expect to see that any of that on the moon, with the exception of that uh, thorium rich layer which we're still trying to figure out according to this model, there should have been just a layer of plagioclase all around the uh, the moon. Instead, we see these mares and yep. trying to figure out if, if something disrupted things to allow this to uh, basalt to flow up and form, or, um, you know, or was it just the presence of the earth, you know? Yeah, it does was seem it? coincidental that all of it ended up on the earth side, <laughs> so. Uh, I won't speculate too much further than that. <laughs> yeah, I could see where there'd be a number of hypotheses and then I'm sure uh, they've done a lot of work towards the various ones. Obviously nothing has uh, filtered to the top yet. Mm -hmm. Cool. Because it's something to look forward to in the uh, research seasons to come. I think so. Well, I don't know, is, is, does lunar research have a season? Well, it will once we get back new moon rocks. <laughs> ah, yes, yes. Depending on supply side issues. Do you have any more questions? Me and Annie. Well, if there are no more questions, uh, I think thank we have you, more. Dr. Sullivan, for your time today and for sharing your knowledge with us. Zian would love to have you come back again soon. And before we go, I would just like to mention again that if you enjoyed today's present event, please consider making a donation at the museum.org slash donate. Your generosity is what makes events like this possible. Thanks.
Thanks again to everyone for coming and please keep an eye out on our website for our next Meet the Expert event and other events like this. Thanks again to everyone.